Good morning, brothers and sisters. Are you happy to be in church today? I've been a Seventh-day Adventist for 30 years. And today I want to take you down memory lane. I have a little article here that was written by none other than C.D. Brooks. He's actually one of my favorite preachers. And he says, I want my church back. And it's such a nice saying, I want my church back. Amongst us, there are those who appear to be tired of our message, bored with it. There's a swelling cry for something different, unique. Some are saying, we want a modern message designed for young people that doesn't go along with the awesome prophecy of Malachi 4. For when the Elijah message comes just before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the Bible says the hearts of the fathers and the children will be turned together. We are not to be divided by age and generation. Well, C.D. Brooks seems to have a problem. He says, if there's no discipline, there's no care. He says, rationalism is an idol. Well, it started already with René Descartes, but today, well, there seems to be a growing curse. And what about culture? Shall we introduce culture? And he talks about dress, and he talks about praise and music and all of these issues. And then he keeps on coming back and saying, I want my church back. I want to be in that church where good old-time religion reigns. I want my church back. We were known for that kind of music, classical, dignified, warm, moving. I want my church back. Then he laments the state of the church. And he quotes a little poem which says, Though ages come and go, Though mountains wear away and seas retire, Destruction lays earth's mighty golden cities low, and empire, states, and dynasties expire. But caught and handed onward to the wise, truth never dies. And then he says, there's no change. Fifty years ago, I joined this church. I've been somewhat educated, illuminated, experienced. I'm getting ready to retire, which he already has. But I want to tell you, Nothing's changed. God's law is still a transcript of his character. It's too high for us, so he gave us a ladder. The sanctuary is still in heaven. It isn't going anywhere. God still hates pride. Men are still born in sin. And he still sends the Holy Ghost. And he says, we need a revival. We need to go back to primitive godliness. I want my church back. And I want to reminisce on this issue. And here's a nice little book. It's called Separation from the World. And the author is one Charles H. Watson, president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, 1930 to 1936. This is old-fashioned stuff. Did you know that? Old-fashioned stuff. Good grief. Did you know the gospel is 2,000 years old? Actually, more. And Watson, speaking to the General Conference, had the following to say. Man, by his own choice, took himself off the foundation. But man's moving off did not move the foundation. That foundation is the will of God, which is the essence of all truth. And we either build on this foundation or we build on sand. 
And then he laments the terrible experience of the children of God throughout the ages. It started off so beautifully with Adam and Eve in their innocence in the Garden of Eden. And they were beguiled by the serpent. And man fell from his high state. And in the end, bloodshed, tears, suffering, destruction by a flood. Had God failed? Well, he still had one family left. They weren't perfect. And then he started all over again. And how soon they all capitulated again. And Nimrod became a mighty warrior before the Lord, actually against the Lord. And history tells the story. Eventually God called forth Abraham and the children of Israel, and they were to be the representatives of God on this planet. And how miserably they failed. How miserably. They went out with a whimper instead of a shout. And so God raised up his church, and Jesus raised up his church on this planet. And they went forth with a battle cry, and they preached the gospel. But Paul lamented that already in his time there were forces at work to subjugate the message. And soon the church went into a time period which history calls the Dark Ages. Because the world sought, the church sought the world and the favor of the world. And it was more important to be with kings and earthly elements than it was to be with God. And so God had to call the Reformation and God called the reformers, and they went forth preaching the word, the word, Jesus Christ is the savior of this world. There is no king but Jesus. And then the reformation whittled out until eventually it took its tail between its legs and started drifting, drifting, drifting back to Rome. So God raised up a remnant and God told the remnant, preach the message. Give the clarion sound, the final message to the world. Restore the everlasting gospel. Give the message. Come out of her, my people. And then he laments Watson, president of the General Conference. And he says, are we going to go out with a whimper? Are we going to go out with a whimper? Are we going to fail miserably? Will it be the greatest failure that ever has been witnessed by the heavenly universe? The message by which we are made the remnant requires that we separate from the world. Why? Because otherwise we shall meet with the most awful failure that has ever overtaken a people. Observe the statement God of God regarding that. Come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her plagues. There's only one measuring line. There's only one truth. So the simple teaching of the gospel is that sinful man can enter life only through death. He must die to the world that he might live to God. And it seems this president knew exactly what the status quo was. Brethren, my heart tells me that our need is great, far, far too great to be met by anything that the world can supply. We must go to the source of help higher than the world. An impassioned plea. And so, so long ago, I was intrigued by what he what he had to say. Remember 1930, there was no such thing as television or anything like that. And then he says the following, this is what we must do. 
We should be examples in simple living, in economy, in consecration, in sacrifice. The homes should be models in the community in which they live. And secondly, our workers should be examples in social relationships. They should not give license by their presence or in any other manner to the attendance of the theater or the movie, to the commercialized baseball, good grief, what's wrong with this president? Of other professional sports to the worldly party. And then he says, point number three, the preacher of the gospel has no part to act as a politician. His mission is to all men. He should keep free from class prejudice, racial rivalries, and national animosities. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, meek, instructing those who oppose. Our workers should teach and exemplify in their lives and homes the principle of healthful living. And he runs down this list. We should be an example in Sabbath keeping. We should be an example in matters of dress, in dignity. And then he laments what comes over the radio. Good grief. What would he do today? He says, Christ's true representative will make careful selection of that which comes over the radio. He will find neither time nor pleasure in listening to popular radio comedians, nor in quoting the sayings of characters, etc. Well, and his eighth point, the relations governing and the association of men and women should be characterized by Christian reserve and dignity. A cordiality which never admits of familiarity and purity of speech which never descends to vulgarity. And then he says, we need revival. We need revival. We need revival. Now, I've only been an Adventist for 30 years. And 30 years ago, <clears throat> when I came into this church, this church was still the remnant. This was the remnant of God. This was the remnant that was being gathered from all the churches. This was the remnant that was going to proclaim the three angels' messages to the glory of God. This was a special people, a peculiar people, different from all other people, a special treasure. And I remember so distinctly that everybody believed that God had created the world in six days. Good grief. Six days? There was no issue regarding this point. In six days he had created the heavens and the earth. And he was our savior and he was ministering in the sanctuary above. And he had entered into the most holy place in 1844. Since then, he has been removed by the Ford movement and I think the sanctuary somehow disintegrated up there and fell out of the sky. But as C.D. Brooks says, the sanctuary is still there even if people want to remove it from its foundation. Truth is truth. 30 years ago, when you walked into a Seventh-day Adventist church, everybody knew who they were. A woman knew she was a woman, and a man knew she was, he was a man. Today, there's so much confusion. Today, projects that were to unite everyone. Or today, there are projects that tend to unite everyone. Well, in those days, there were projects to separate from the world. Things have turned around. Things have become strange. What has happened to our church? Has truth language or has our attitude changed? 
I read here in Proverbs chapter 7 a portion that perhaps can be interpreted in different ways. Chapter 7, verse 1. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Remember that Jesus said, my, my commandments are not burdensome. My yoke is easy, my yoke is light. There are some people that say when Jesus was a carpenter that he probably manufactured yokes. Nice, light yokes for oxen. If Jesus cared about oxen, how much more so will he care about us? And this, this personal touch, my son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. So Solomon's conclu conclusion as to what wisdom really is can be boiled down to fear God and keep his commandments because this is the whole duty of man. And this is the the bastion which God created for his remnant. He has cleaved them out of the world using the Sabbath as a knife to bring them into communion with himself so that we recognize where we come from because only if we recognize where we come from do we know where we are going. And so he has called us out of the world into his remnant. That's what everybody believed 30 years ago when I joined the church. Today there are movements which say, no, 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 we're still a remnant, but we're the glue. We're not separate, we're glue. We have the capacity to glue everyone together because we can reach out to different ones because we have the law, we have Jesus, we have health, we have all of these issues. We're the glue. The Bible says, come out and be separate. Not be the glue. So where is this wisdom, Solomon? Proverbs 7 verse 5 says, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For as at the window of my house, I looked through my casement. And beheld amongst the simple ones, I discerned amongst the youth, a young man void of understanding. So he's standing in his house. Now what is the house? It's his church. He's standing in his house, in God's church. And he looks out and he sees there are some going astray. And they are void of understanding. Now, who are these who are without understanding compared to those who have understanding? Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal up the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now we just read that those who are wise have the commandments of God in their hearts, and they've made a difference between the world and God's people. God's people are called to be a light, a special light in the world. If we are no different than the world, if we do not appear different, why should people be attracted to this truth? Proverbs 7 verse 8. Passing through the street near a corner, and he went the way to her house. 
So he left from his house and he went to her house. Now when the Bible uses this symbol of the woman, the pure woman and the apostate woman, then it's talking about the church. And are we drifting? Are we drifting towards her house? In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. She always works in darkness. She always is clandestine. And what has light and darkness got in common? Why are men attracted to darkness? And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. Now what is the attire of a harlot? Isn't it crimson? And the Bible describes such a woman in the Bible saying that she wears crimson. She's loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the street, and lieth in wait at every corner. She's universal. She's everywhere. She's all over. Her tentacles are everywhere. <clears throat> and so she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have a peace offering. Ooh, so she's religious. She has a peace offering. I have a peace offering with me this day, and I've paid my vows. She's very religious. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. Isn't it sad? When Hezekiah capitulated and he allowed the Babylonians to come from a far country and he showed them all the treasures of his house, how it took a prophet to rebuke him and how eventually it led to total demise. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. Well, the linen definitely wasn't from Israel. The linen was from Egypt. And I've perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. And then she says, verse 19, for the good man is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. Now the New King James renders that, For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. And he has taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. Who's she speaking about? Isn't she speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ? So he has gone on a long journey. But not only that, he took the money with him. And she's not very happy about that. So let us do our thing down here because he has taken the money with him. Where should our treasure be? Down here? Or should we wait for him to return with his reward? Doesn't he say, my reward is with me? Do not lay for yourselves up treasure on this earth where the moth can get at it. No, no. Have your treasure up there. I long for my church. I long for a church that stands for the principles of eternal truth that are laid on a foundation that cannot be moved. When I came into this church 30 years ago, Rome was 
the Antichrist. Today, the Pope is on the cover of our magazines as an example of humility to all mankind. In those days, 30 years ago, he was the Antichrist. In those days, you could preach the three angels' messages and you needed no independent ministry to do it because the church was your platform. Wherever you went, the church welcomed the message. The church stood behind the message. What's happened to that message today? I thought unity projects were for the world outside that had lost their compass and were drifting, 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 drifting back to Rome. My husband has gone on a long journey and he's taking the money bag with him. I want my treasure down here on earth. So come, let's get together. Let's unify. Let's make Projects that unite us. He has the money bag with him. And with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straight away, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strikes through his liver as a bird hastes to the, sa- the, the snare and knoweth not that it'll cost him his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she has cast down Many wounded and many strong men have been slain by her. I want my church back. I want to add my voice to City Brooks. I want my church back. I want my church to be a beacon on a hill. I want my church to warn the world that the ways of the world are the ways of death. I want my church to reflect again the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, that righteousness and unrighteousness has nothing in common. I want my church to be the remnant, the gathering place that will enter into Canaan. We are to give the message, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Today this message is not welcome. No, people that bring messages such as these should be silenced, because we've all discovered that unity is strength, And we don't understand what the difference is between the remnant and the world. We've lost the plot. We don't understand the difference in the plan of salvation between Babylon and the remnant. We don't understand the difference any longer. Because what looks good, what feels good, must be good. Love is not a feeling. Love is a principle. Love stands like a needle to a pole. Love never capitulates. Love stands on an eternal rock. We are in serious trouble. And many, many of our strong men are being destroyed. Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to their doctrines and traditions. And 
lawful alliance with the world must be avoided. The message of Revelation 14 announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to the religious bodies that were once pure and have come become corrupt. Since this message follows the warning of the judgment, it must be given in the last days. Therefore, it cannot refer to the Romish church, for that church has been fallen for many centuries. So who does it refer to? And if the Bible says, come out of her, my people, where are God's people today? Where is the great majority of God's people must be in the fallen churches that profess to love Jesus Christ? We think there's no difference today between Rome and the other churches. We all profess Jesus Christ. But the Bible is very clear. The Antichrist is still the Antichrist. The mark of the beast is still the mark of the beast. And nothing has changed. The eternal platform is unmoved. There is no difference. The Protestant Reformation took Jesus out of the quagmire of darkness and put him back on the pedestal where he belonged. The Protestant Reformation put Jesus back as the only savior of the world. It put the atonement in the center. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This is the core of Christianity. This is Bible-based Christianity. Rome teaches that Christ did not have to die for you. You are not saved by the blood of the Lamb. You are saved by his works. And those works need not have been unto death. Therefore, the atonement is negated. So you are saved by the works and not by the blood. But the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ became man. That Jesus Christ came all the way down. He's the ladder that connects us to divinity, and in his humanity connects divinity to humanity. And the Bible teaches us that he came all the way down. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ touched the leper. He's the only one that reached out and touched him. When a leper came by, the leper would shout, unclean, unclean. And what did the people do? They'd scatter. What did Jesus do? He went and he touched the leper, and they became clean. Jesus Christ came all the way down. Catholicism teaches Jesus did not come all the way down. He's too holy to come all the way down to this fallen humanity. And therefore, they create a circumstance, a vehicle, a spacecraft, if you like, whereby he can stay above the level of the earth. And they declare this through the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, where Mary is conceived immaculately so that there is an immaculate vehicle for the Son of God to come to humanity. So as Mother Teresa said, no Mary, no Jesus. And in one of my sermons, I wanted to remind her, excuse me, no Jesus, no Mary. Because before Abraham was, he was. And because he didn't come all the way down, he needs mediators. So you place the church in the mediating position, and you place the saints in the mediating position, and you place Mary in the mediating position. 
And Satan had always accused God of being unrighteous. Because how dare God throw him out of heaven and then redeem man. If God was going to be constant, then God had to be constant in his actions. And if the wages of sin is death, then justice demands death. So Satan said, you cannot forgive man without forgiving me. Otherwise, you are not what you say. You cannot be gracious and just at the same time. The two exclude each other. And that is precisely what Catholicism teaches. It teaches that God, in order to be just and gracious, forgives you your sins, but you still have to pay for your sins. That's salvation by works. You still have to pay for your sins. And in order to make you pay for sins which are forgiven, they invent purgatory, which doesn't occur in the Bible. And there, in purgatory, you pay for the sins which are forgiven. That's salvation by works. The Bible teaches that Jesus died for you and for me, and he paid the full price. And I ask myself the question, why do our people not understand this? Why do they not comprehend the difference between these two plans of salvation, where the one is no salvation at all, but a means of attaining greatness in your own power, paying your own price? They deny the atonement. You pay for your own sins. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. They cannot sing that. They cannot sing that. And then, he has even granted all power to release from the suffering to his church. He hasn't come all the way down. You don't go to him, you go to the church. And so Pope Francis has just announced that from December this year, for one year, will be a special time of grace where there will be indulgences because the church will release people from the suffering of sin on the other side. Excuse me, how does this work logically? How do you logically release from the suffering and consequences of your sin if your dogma says justice demands you pay? Well, they have developed a nice little trick which they call the the storehouse of the church where the additional merit of all the saints that went before and the additional merit of Mary who did much more than is necessary to go to heaven and the saints too where the Pope can take that additional merit and apply it to someone who has too little merit and release him from the bondage of purgatory. And this is what is being hailed as a Christian form of salvation. It negates Jesus. It marginalizes it. It puts a mere fallible man on the throne to take his place. And then it makes him infallible. And because he is infallible, by dogma, he cannot err. And because he cannot err, it is altogether necessary for every person to be subject to that power in order to be saved. How is it possible that we have so many projects in the world which seem to indicate that there is no difference between Protestantism and Catholicism this day? I was intrigued to read in the spirit of prophecy 
where it states, Jesus was a Protestant. Jesus protested against the inadequacies of the teachings of the Pharisees. Jesus set straight the record. And soon we will have to give a loud cry because we are heading towards a time such as never was when the law of God will be made void, where it has been placed in the latest encyclicals. The Lord calls for a renewal of the straight testimony born in years past. He calls for a renewal of spiritual life. The spiritual energies of his people have long been torpid but there is to be a resurrection from apparent death. By prayer and confession of sin, we must clear the king's highway. I want my church back. What about you? You want your church back? I want my church back. The unfaithfulness of the church to Christ in permitting her confidence and affections to be turned from him and allowing the love of worldly things to occupy the souls is likened to the violation of the marriage vow. And the Lord has these sad words. And thou wast exceedingly beautiful, Ezekiel. And thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth amongst the heathen for thy beauty. For it was perfect through my comeliness, through his comeliness which I had put upon thee. She wore the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> there was not one thread of self woven into this cloth. Salvation was entirely as a consequence of the merits of Christ. But, did, but thou didst trust in thine beauty and pledged the harlot because of thy renown. As a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel. And a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. Where are we in the stream of time? She writes, many of the Protestant churches are following Rome's example of iniquitous connection with the kings of this world. And in the latest movements in the United States, the church has claimed, the evangelical church has claimed officially, church and state must work together. Our people are now being tested as to whether they will obtain their wisdom from the greatest teacher the world has ever known, or whether they will seek it elsewhere. I want my church back. I remember the days 30 years ago when I went even to Europe and spoke on the platform of the church. And wherever the message was broadcast, the church was there. It was in harmony with the church. Today this speaker is banned, that speaker is banned, this one is destroying our ecumenical relationships, that one's doing this, the other. And we have spirits of Pentecostalism coming into the church. 30 years ago, spiritual formation was an occult spiritualism practiced by Jesuits. Today, it seems, it's welcome in some circles. With the Roman power and under the influence of the threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome and trample on the rights of conscience. We are approaching that time. Protestantism, she says, will change. Now, in the recent series that we just recorded, we looked at a document that is celebrating the coming together of all the churches to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And in that document, one is horrified to read that every single pillar of Protestantism has been surrendered. Every single one. Down to the acceptance of the Eucharist as the literal body and blood of Christ. 
down to the acceptance that priests can forgive sins, down to the acceptance of the infallibility of a mortal born in sin, with not a word of remonstrance. She writes, there's just as wide a gulf today between Rome and Protestantism of Luther, Cranmer, Ridley, Hooper, and the noble army of martyrs as there was when these men made the protest which gave them the name Protestants. And then I want to read you this quote from her own pen. Christ was a Protestant. He protested against the formal worship of the Jewish nation who rejected the counsel of God against themselves. He told them that they taught for doctrines the commandments of men and that they were pretenders and hypocrites, whitewashed sepulchres, beautiful without, but full of impurity within. The reformers date back to Christ and the apostles. They came out and separated themselves from the religions of form and ceremony. If we are a remnant, if we are called by God as a gathering place of those who choose rather to believe the Bible as it stands, then we must be a remnant through and through. There can be no half measure. You cannot be partly of Christ and partly of Belial. You have to be either all of Christ or all of Belial. I want my church back. I want it back. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and shun it. Today it is putting forth such a fair face and people are duped left, right and center. And our great men, many of our leaders, are putting out efforts to silence people who will expose this power. I want my church back. We are to enter into no confederacy with the world, supposing that by doing so we would accomplish more. If any stand in the way to hinder the advancement of the work in lines that God has appointed, they will displease God. No line of our faith that has made us what we are is to be weakened. We have the old landmarks of truth, experience, and duty. We are to stand firmly in defense of our principles, in full view of the world. We're not to go out with a whimper. Is God's cause going to languish again? Is it going to fade as ancient Israel faded when it said we have no king but Caesar? Or are we going to stand up as a people? Are we going to say enough is enough? We don't want syncretism. We don't want worldly worship synchronized and mixed and mingled with heavenly worship. We want to sing as angels sing. We want to worship as angels worship. We want to cover our heads and look down on the law. We want to look at the mercy seat and understand the plan of salvation. We want to know who our Savior is. We want to stand for his righteousness. We want to stand for his law because it is the transcript of his character. We have nothing to be ashamed of, nothing. Jeremiah writes, O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayst be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For a voice declareth from Dan, and publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make ye mention to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country, and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. The watchers are here. They're on our doorstep. They're going to speak 
before Congress. As keepers of a field are they against her around about, because she has been rebellious against me, says the Lord. Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness, because it is bitter, because it reaches into thine heart. My bowels, my bowels, I'm pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise within me. I cannot hold my peace. Because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Like Jeremiah, I would say, I can hear the sound of the trumpet. I can hear the sound of war. And many great men are sleeping on Egyptian linen. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but they do, to do good they have no knowledge. Do we want to fall into that category as did ancient Israel? And Jesus gives a few parables for the time in which we live. He says there was a certain householder who planted a vineyard. And he hedged it round. And he digged a wine press in it and he built a tower. And he let it out to the husbandman and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive the fruits thereof. And you know the story. They stoned them. They beat them up. They killed them. Eventually he sent his son. Surely they will accept him. But they said, oh, this is the heir. Let's kill him. Mankind hasn't changed. The devil hasn't lost his art. We are heading, we are heading for a confrontation. And the question is, who is going to be on the Lord's side? Who is going to represent him? What is the remnant going to look like? Has the remnant become glue and has spread through the nations to glue evil to righteousness? Or has the remnant separated itself from the world? Has the remnant rethought its position? Has the remnant taken its stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel? This is the question we need to ask ourselves. Matthew 24, verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house, that's the head of the family, had known in what, what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is the good and faithful servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over the household to give them meat in season? That's a good question. Blessed is that servant, whom when his Lord cometh shall find him doing so. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. Now, we're not talking about a worldly person here. We're not talking about someone out there we're talking about a servant. We're talking about someone in the church who says the Lord delays his coming. What are these people who are constantly speaking about the end is coming? You're just fear mongers. You're creating fear. We have a gospel of peace and love. Stop this preaching of danger. We have many, many strong men who think in these lines. So if the evil servant 
shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and he shall begin to smite his fellow servant. In other words, if someone sets himself up within the church as a leader and starts to smite the fellow servants that would bring the message, they are in serious trouble. And then to eat and drink with drunken. So the servant starts to eat and drink with the drunken. Now who's drunk? The Bible has two categories of drunks in the Bible, in the Word of God. The one category is those who are drunk with the blood of the saints. We know who that is. Over 1,260 years she persecuted Protestantism and anyone who believed the Bible. The Bible calls her drunk with the blood of the saints. That's the one group of drunken. But there's another group, those who are drunk with the wine of Babylon, who have taken her doctrines, who have given up the special knowledge of the word of God for the sake of worldly attention. So if you start eating and drinking with the drunken, then you are in the ecumenical movement. And then you start beating your fellow servants. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of it, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I remember the days 30 years ago. If you were a minister in this church, you could preach anywhere in the world. Today you cannot. There are bars and blockages and stoppages. And they will tell you what to preach and what not to preach and how to say it and how not to say it and send out little secret messages, banning this one, banning that one. I want my church back. I want my church back. I want the God of heaven to find a church that trusts him. I want the God of heaven to find a church that is totally dependent upon him. I want the God of heaven to find a church that loves him with their whole heart and with their whole soul and with their whole mind. I want a church that puts the standard of God foremost in its life, that keeps the commandments of God and holds to the testimony of Jesus. I want a faithful church that warns people from the precipice, not chases them over the precipice. I want a church that is the remnant. May God help us. May God lead us to serious introspection. May we look at upon ourselves. May we look upon our habits. May we look upon our actions. Let us become the people that God can use to bring the loud cry. May the Lord bless you and keep you as you ponder these things in your heart. And may my church, my beautiful, beautiful church, may my church wake up. In Jesus' name, amen.